Good morning, everyone. Hey, I want to welcome you to Lemon Cove Community Church. If you're here in person, we're, we're glad to see you. And if you're visiting us online, we're glad to have you with us as well. We would also like to welcome our guest speaker today, Jason Meyer. He comes to us from Sierra Vista Church. He's the associate pastor at Sierra Vista Church in Oakhurst. Welcome, Jason. We want to tell you a few things that are happening in the church today. And Dee's working on, so I don't have to do it. <laughs> we uh, have communication cards that are in the back of the pew. Oh, and I also have to say, I am Kelly Merton. I forgot to say that. I am a uh, ordained uh, previous um, elder and past elder, and I'm also our current, uh, current deacon here at our church. Um, so uh, going along, we do have the communication cards in the back of the pews. Um, if you are visiting with us, please fill that out and just put it in the offering plate on the way or in the box that's in the back of the church, and that way we can get to know you and uh, get in touch with you. We have Gospel Community Group coming up on Monday, and they do that at 6.30, I believe it is, at, on Monday nights. They join for dinner and Bible study, and you're welcome to join their, their group as well. Our Lemon Cove small group is going to uh, skip one week, so our next meeting is going to be on April 17th. So no, no Bible study this week. We come back next week. Um, buildings and Grounds Cleanup Day is going to be scheduled soon, so please, there is a sheet on the back, bulletin board, so um, indicate which Saturday that you would prefer to come and help work, and uh, you can sign up on the back bulletin board for cleanup around the church. Are there any other announcements? Okay, George Barnes is our liturgist today, and he'll get us started. Thank you, Kelly. Last weekend, we celebrated Good Friday and Easter Sunday. On Good Friday, Jesus shared the Jewish Passover meal with his disciples. The Passover celebrated how God rescued his people out of slavery in Egypt with great power. Part of the celebration would have been reciting or singing the Hallel together, Psalms 113 to 118. This means that the last songs we know Jesus sang for certain before his crucifixion were these Psalms. This morning we will follow these songs with Jesus, reflecting on a response of praise for his mighty acts and turning over what it was like for Jesus to pray these psalms with the cross before him. Praise God now through Psalm 117, reading responsibly as you'll find on the screen. Praise Lord, all you nations, extol him, all you peoples. Holy God, you are worthy of our praise. There is no one more worthy. You love the lost, the weary, the sinner, the low, the broken, and those others who consider themselves worthless or hopeless. And your love changes us. We praise you. Be present with us this morning. We love you and want you near. We long for your power, your goodness, and love to transform us, to strengthen us, to make us good, to help us to love. Fill this place and fill your people, for we now pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand, if you are able, to praise God singing together. Did you hear the mountains tremble? chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, which say, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, let us come to the throne of grace with confidence 
so that we may, re we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. Would you please join me now in our prayer of confession? Almighty and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from your ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against your holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare those who confess their faults. Restore those that are penitent according to your promises declared to us in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of your holy name. Amen. <coughs> Would you please take a few moments to silently confess your personal sins? Lord, we pray in the words of your servant Daniel, O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. Amen. The assurance of pardon is given in Psalm 103, verses 11 through 13. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from him. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to all those who fear him. Brothers and sisters, by faith in Jesus Christ, our sin is washed away, for God's compassion for us never ends. We are forgiven. Amen. Hey, as we share our praises and our blessings, our pleas, petitions for ourselves and for our loved ones in prayers of the people, how can we be praying for each other this week? Elaine. Well, I have a praise. Little Henry arrived. All right. <laughs> yeah. On Wednesday. 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 Everybody doing good? Yes, Diane. Uh, prayers for my friend Jesse, who was supposed to have a stint removed this next week, but she is in total pain and going to have to have a gallbladder. Oh. So prayers that they get it and she heals so that she can get the stint removed still. Okay. For Jesse, who's going to have a stint removed. Um, her gallbladder instead of a stent and hopefully yeah. that stent. Yes. Kat. Um, my dad had surgery on the 12th, um, but he's sick now, so I don't know if they're going to be able to do it. Okay. So hopefully he gets better, but also continue the prayer for Gary, Bobby, Richard, Sharon, and then Kenny. He's been sick too. Get them all in there. Thank you, Kat. Yes, Mary. Well, praise be with Kayla and Kayla's yeah. children. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes, 
George. Uh, Cal and Ray for their procedures on their backs. Yes, Sally. I'd like to ask for prayers for my patient. His name is Jimmy, and he's had an injury. Um, and we'll see the doctor on Tuesday, and I'm praying that God provides a treatment plan for him. Okay. Yes, Margaret. <clears throat> um, continued prayers for my cousin's friend. She's still in the hospital. She had a procedure last Thursday, and she developed aphid from that. She's been exhausted and, and weak, but um, she's doing okay. They removed the fluid from around her heart, and they're hoping that she can do physical therapy. So, um, as soon as I learn more, I'll be posted. But thank you for the prayers last week and continued prayers that come forward. Yes. Yes, Mike. Yes, Ellen. Uh, for my son Keith, um, he broke his foot a couple weeks ago, but this past Wednesday or Thursday, he had stroke-like symptoms. Um, his EKG showed high potassium, but they're thinking that maybe um, it might have might be from a blood clot. But he's waiting to get into his doctor down in Sampson to. Finished doing some testing that Square Delta didn't do. Mm, okay. Yes, Nancy. Uh, prayers for Craig Wickering as he's traveling in Southeast Asia doing number care. Yes, Nancy. Um, just pray that Craig is feeling a little bit better and uh, just praying that that can be resolved so that he can have a good life. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dad's having some testing, um, just biopsy to see what his new mass is on his prostate. So it looks like the cancer's come back, but they're not sure until they get in. And that's going to be, um, I guess, after the, probably the 15th or the 16th. So. Okay. Any other names or any other prayers? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, you've heard each of our prayers this morning. Lord, we lift up our prayers to you for your healing touch, for hope and comfort, for relief from pain, and for those that are going through recovery. Not only those we know and love, but those known only to you, that they may know the peace and joy of your supporting care. We continue to be amazed by your blessings and marvel at how you love us. Hear our prayers, O oh God of grace, and fulfill them according to your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay. This summer, Joan and I are going to go to uh, a place called Rancho Ebenezer in Honduras. And if you've been here before, we've, uh, we've talked about this from time to time because we've been there about 10, 10, 
times or so. Uh, it, during the summer, we go down. And Rancho Ebenezer is a ranch for uh, some children in Honduras, Tegucigalpa, who have either they're orphans or they've been removed from their families because their parents are abusive or these children were rescued uh, wandering the streets or the garbage dumps of Tegucigalpa. Anyway, they're, it's, it's a home for the kids. They, they are, get a, a Christian home environment. They live in little homes uh, in groups of four or five students at a, our children at a time under the tutelage of what is called mentor parents who are missionaries or Christian Honduran families. There's a Christian school there. And we go down in the summer, we kind of give, uh, sometimes we filled in as dorm parents or done, do activities with the children and kind of just energize the, the staff because during the summer they're out, the kids are out of school and there's not a lot for them to do there. So groups like us come down and uh, minister to the kids that way. So this is kind of a scene from the, their ball field. The children live in homes. It's an 80-acre ranch. There's coffee plants over there and banana plants. It's really cool. It's up in the mountains, so it's not hot. It's very pleasant uh, conditions there. They get a Christ-centered environment. Their physical, emotional, education, and spiritual needs are met. And they live in these homes. But uh, I was talking to a, a couple weeks ago, the missionaries who coordinate trips of like us, Chris and Steve Nelson, and they're, they're new down there last year. And uh, I really like Chris because she's super organized, and she, they have a heart for the, the kids, and they, they have got visions on how to make things better. And at near the end of our conversation, she said, we have this idea to, to convert one of the homes that's not used for kids into a children's center because there's no real central place to, to do like activities other than the cafeteria or one of the classrooms in the, the school. When, like when groups like us come down, we want to do games or arts and crafts or uh, have a teen uh, game night or watch movies or something like that. Uh, so uh, as she was talking about this, I thought this is a terrific idea. It would just really be an asset to the facilities and the programs, a long-term uh, need there. So here's like, this was last year, we're playing games with the teenagers and just sitting around the, the cafeteria tables there. And there is a home, one of the homes is unused, and she said we could convert one of the, the bedrooms to like a toddler room with toys and, and activities for toddlers. The next room could be like for the preschool age kids. We could have a high school room with maybe sewing machines and jewelry making, and, and we could have a music room with uh, maybe uh, instruments and keyboards and things like this. And a central area could be like couches and, and uh, make a little kitchen things like that, I thought this would be just really terrific. So this is the house. Uh, it's called Casa Bondad, which house of goodness. It's unused. It's ready to be remodeled and serve as a children's center. So I, I, I really got excited about this, and I called back Chris the next, the, the next day, and I said, what does it take to, to get this thing going? And she said, well, our, our board is all for it. It would cost about $5,000 just to, to kind of clean up the house, get it painted, fix the screens and things like that, and get some of the basic furnishings. And then maybe another 5000 to get some of the, the different things for, for the rooms. I said, that doesn't sound like very much. Uh, she said, yeah, that's, that's the good news. The bad news is our, our mission board has no money, and we'd have to submit a, a, like a budget proposal in for January and maybe uh, in 2025 some money would be designated for this. And I said, that's no good. So I wonder if we can, if, if we got the money from another, if the funds came in from another source, could we get this thing going? She said, definitely. So this is our uh, proposal. I said, I think I know some people in Lemon Cove, California that might get behind something like this. And it's kind of a small church, but their hearts are large. And uh, I think they could really get interested in, in making a long-term difference for the kids at Rancho Ebenezer. So like, this is just kind of what we're talking about, converting Casa Bondad into a children's activity center. And uh, this is kind of what the indoor looks like. It's ready to go. It's just empty. That little place right there is, would, would be for the, the hook up a stove and an oven and, and just empty room. There's no furniture in there. And just imagine this. Maybe on Christmas morning, there's a little Christmas tree over there. Uh, the kids come in in their PJs. Someone's making waffles. They, they can sit around there and sing uh, Christmas carols. Yeah, Tom, you have a job there. <laughs> I thought this, you know, I just got really excited. You can imagine uh, having staff meetings or uh, Bible studies in the group in the room there. And this is one of the, the used to be a bedroom. It just, just needs 
just needs cleanup, maybe paint it, maybe put some murals on the walls and uh, get some, some neat window coverings to make it look really great. So, like I said, it would cost about $5,000 to, to renovate the room, remodel, fix the screens, things like that, and then another $5,000 for uh, things to outfit the room. The labor would be done by teams that are coming down there this summer. Maybe, maybe we would even work on it. I'm going to go down June 18, and uh, the, so the labor would be free. So here's what I want to throw out to our church is that we would... Uh, jumpstart this project with $5,000 from our church that would go immediately for this need. And so they could buy things and get ready in June to, to start renovating the Casa Bondad. And uh, I can assure you that 100% of the, any monies given would go there to this need. There's not going to be any administrative costs skimming off the top or any of it, you know, whatever bureaucratic fees. So it's just going to go from our pockets to their needs, and 100% will be designated for this. So for the next couple of weeks, we want to take some offerings. It would be a special offering, and if you want, would like to give in the usual ways through our offering baskets, so you can, if you want to write a check, make sure you designate it to the ranch house project, or you, if you give online, you can designate gifts, or I guess the box back there, just make sure you designate it, or you can even give it just to me or Joan. Uh, we'll be happy to make sure that it gets where it belongs. And uh, any questions, we'll be happy to ask, answer them or ans and uh, fill you in on this. And just these are just some of the kids. And I would look forward, to, as we come back from the, our summer, to maybe show the finished pictures of the finished projects where some of these kids are enjoying the, the activity center. All right. D. Casa Bondad. Casa Bondad means house of goodness. The, the, the ranch is called Rancho Ebenezer. It's run by World Gospel Outreach. That's the parent organization. Whoops. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Well, that's a great opportunity. And um, uh, I have another opportunity for you as well. Um, as you know, some of you know, we uh, support prayerfully... Uh, couple of missionary families. One is the Woodrings that live um, up near you. And uh, they are involved in member care. Member care is caring for missionaries. They are former missionaries. They've been missionaries for 40 plus years in uh, the Southeast Asia area. And right now, Craig sent a message to the church asking for a special prayer and um, and maybe some financial support if you feel the need. Let me explain what he's doing there. He is currently right now in um, Southeast Asia and uh, the Nepal area, and he is um, uh, working um, two purposes. They're planning on meeting with both Nepali and expat, expat co-workers to explore how to start a network for reaching into the high altitude valleys of the Himalayas, and those high places are really, really hard places to reach with the good news. Um, the other purpose is to meet with several colleagues um, from when they live there as member care check-in, and that will involve some informal debriefing and some training in member care. And the friends that he's meeting with are also trying to get involved in member care. And then after some time in Kathmandu, he's headed to Cairo, and he is going to be working with uh, International YWAM Member Care Consul Consultation. YWAM stands for Youth with a Mission. That's the organization that they've been involved with for many, many years. And uh, they haven't had a chance to connect since COVID. So it's their first in-person meeting since 2019. And he's looking forward to connecting with his coworkers and his friends from Southeast Asia. And so there'll be training workshops as well. It should be rewarding um, it would really help. He was asking for help in supporting this trip, and um, he was trying to raise three thousand five hundred dollars for this. If you would like to, um, you feel led to give to this, or this is something that touches your heart, uh, Dee has provided some information uh, slips in the back that have their uh, address that you can donate to their um, ministry directly. It's MEI, and he's 
there for two weeks. They also have another trip planned to Nepal in November. So this is extra beyond what they normally raise for their um, support. And they were hoping to share some of the money that they raise with the nationals that live there as a gift. So um, if this is something that sounds great to you, you have the opportunity back there. It's um, a really worthy cause. And um, hopefully someday soon, Craig and Jennifer will be back, will be back here to, to tell us about it in person. Thank you. I was looking at the bulletin, and the bulletin says the children are coming next. Right. Well, that's right. But that's okay. Again, my name is Pastor Jason, and uh, it is a great blessing for me to be with you this morning and that we get this chance to celebrate the, the Lord's Supper, Supper together, to, to feast at the Lord's table. And um, I think that having communion... Uh, the Sunday following Easter is an especially hopeful time. Um, we have fresh in our minds the fullness of the hope that is found in Jesus, the fullness of his death and resurrection, uh, and um, the hope and the renewal that, that comes with that. I feel like it is um, John 3.16, fresh and in action on our mind, right? That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that any of us that would believe in him should not perish but have eternal life with him. And that is the hope of the gospel and that is what we celebrate and remember as we take communion together. And um, uh, I think that also uh, this reminds us that communion is not always needing to be a somber occasion. Of course, as we did our prayers of confession and as we did um, our assurance of pardon, uh, those aspects of the church remind us that we do need to be forgiven of our sins. And yet, communion can be a joyful time. It can be a time when we celebrate what the Lord is doing and uh, we celebrate that uh, the Holy Spirit has come, that Jesus going away has meant that the Holy Spirit could come and that he is our helper and our protector. And communion can be a reminder of that as well. And so, this morning, as we take the sacrament together, um, I think that I just want to remind you that we have an opportunity for hope, an opportunity for renewal, an opportunity to be strengthened by the Holy Spirit and to encourage one another, and that we would continue in our faith, uh, celebrating the one who is the way and the truth and the life. Um, and so this morning, may your faith in Jesus be renewed as we share the bread and the juice and um, I want to say that if you're a believer here this morning, of course, all are welcome to come and to share this time with us at the table. And I think that if by chance there happens to be somebody here who doesn't know the Lord, that you don't have a relationship with Jesus, what a great time to make your faith in Christ um, real right now, to commit your life to Christ and to come forward and to share this time that we have together uh, as we reflect on Jesus and all that he's done for us. So... Now I think George is going to read for us the words from God, the words from First Corinthians from God's Word. Here are the words of the institution of the Lord's Supper from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now as we, um, now as we um, pass out the elements, just want to remind you that I understand that the custom here is that we'll pass the bread and um, as you reflect on the Lord and as you feel led as it comes down, you go ahead and take the bread at your own leisure as it goes around. 
Uh, but when we do pass the cups around, um, you'll wait and we'll do it together and it'll be a sign of unity for us uh, as the body of Christ. And so let's go ahead and I think the servers will come now and we'll, we'll serve.
cup of the new covenant, um, God's blood given for us uh, until he returns, that we would remember and celebrate him. You join me in a prayer. God, we thank you for the reminder of what it took to save us and to bring us into fellowship with you. God, I pray that you would help us to go from this place renewed and passionate to love and to serve you in this world. I pray, God, that you would empower us by your spirit. We give you praise and honor and glory this morning for all that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm sure we're all so happy to see the, some of the Hodge children here today. And uh, now it's the time for the children's, um, uh, children's message and the children's song. Deja vu all over again. <laughs> I have a feeling I've been here before. Uh, so I've been thinking all week about how God is always with us. And uh, well, no matter what our circumstances are, we, and I thought the moment for missions was just awesome. It shows us that there's these children that need some help, and then God is providing people like Mr. Daniels, Mrs. Daniels, and other people to help the children. And uh, I read a, maybe, and it also brings to mind the story of the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I love that story, where, and uh, you know the story where they're told they need to worship an idol, <clears throat> and they won't do it, because they say it's against what God has told them to do, and they're so steadfast in their belief that they, they won't give in. The king throws them into a furnace to burn them up. And while they're in there, the, the king sees there's four people in the fire with him. So God provided uh, a help for the three. They didn't even get, uh, not one hair on their body was singed. Their clothes weren't burned. It was a miracle. And then I read a more contemporary story. It's not a Bible story. It's just a story that you can relate to of a young girl who was, had to go to the dentist. And so she gets in the chair, and the dentist starts, she had a cavity, and so he has to use the drill. You know, you know that noise? <laughs> and even adults get, their heart starts beating when that happens. And so the girl just jumps out of the chair and tries to get away from the situation. And the dentist is used to working with children, so he, he nods and smiles a little bit, and he asks the dad to get in the chair. And the dad thinks, oh, I wonder what he's going to do to me, you know. <laughs> and so he's in the chair, and then he tells the little girl to sit in her dad's lap. And so the girl climbs up, and then she's, she just relapses, because she's in her dad's lap. Then the dentist can do what he needs to do, because the girl's confident that her dad's going to protect her. And I thought, that's a great picture of how God is with us. You know, if we, if, we, if we just get in his lap and let him hold us, we can go through all kinds of situations. Okay? And I wanted to read something from Psalms to you, just a couple of verses. It says, <clears throat> this is from Psalm 91, starting with verse 14. The Lord says, I will rescue those who love me. I will protect those who trust in my name. When they call on me, I will answer. I will be with them in trouble. I will rescue and honor them. I will reward them with a long life and give them my salvation. Can we say amen to that? Amen. amen. All right, let's go to class. I'd like to think this was the highlight of the children's week. It's Sunday school. We provide Sunday school for children just across the 
the courtyard there for children up to about 12 years old. O oh Lord our God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light to our path. Give us grace to receive your truth in faith and love that we may be obedient to your will and always live for your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Scripture reading this morning is from the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be, become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a stars, a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Even if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. May God bless the reading of his word. We now welcome our pastor, Jason Meyer, for today's message. Thank you. <clears throat> now, while I was listening to the children's story, the thing that came to my mind was a bit of trivia, which was, who knows what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's names were in Jewish, they're Israeli names, they're Jewish names. Anybody know? I always think it's funny that uh, we remember their Babylonian names, but we don't remember their Jewish names. Um, of course, I cheated while I was sitting over there. I looked it up. <laughs> it's uh, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. But I had to look it up, so. <laughs> I couldn't remember either, so that's not very fair. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to get into God's Word this morning, and uh, we're going to um, look at the, some aspects of that passage that was just read for us uh, in Philippians chapter 2, and you're welcome to, uh, to join me there if you'd like, 2, 12 through 18 is what we're going to look at. And um, because God's Word is so important and that we would put it into our hearts, I'd like to invite you to pray with me yet one more time as we ask God to bless this time in His Word. Lord, this morning as I pray, uh, I ask God that you would work into us the things that you want us to work out. Help us to become what you want us to be. We live in a time when there's more knowledge and information available than ever before. It's easy to figure out facts and information. And yet the thing that I'm feeling and thinking about is that we need you to transform us, Lord. We need to be made into your likeness to become more like Jesus, and only you can do that. And so this morning I pray that you would use this time not only to learn your word, but that it would be used to transform our lives and our practices. May your word come into our minds, start in our head, but trickle down to our hearts, and then ultimately to our hands and the things that we do, Lord. And for this, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So um, my question to you as we start is, have you ever written a song or a poem? Maybe a hymn. Maybe Steve's written a hymn. Um, <clears throat> Music is something that comes out of the heart. It's something that 
we can't help but have pour out and express and, and come out of us as we uh, in, entangle with life and wrestle with the struggles and the trials and the good things. We just have our emotions are going all over the place and music is one of the ways in which uh, those things just pour out, that expression just pours out. And uh, some people are better at it than others. So I noticed I didn't ask, did you write a good song? I asked, have you written a song or a poem? Um, of course, uh, we've already read some psalms this morning, which are songs, poems. Uh, David, in particular, uh, wrote uh, these songs from heart to the Lord, and we've read some of those things that are very emotional. Um, I think that one of my favorite psalms is Psalm 63. Uh, I'm sure you probably know the words. It says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. You feel in that psalm the heart of David, this desire for God, this passionate pursuit of God, this wanting to know God more than everything. And I have felt that before. I imagine some of you in this room have also felt those times where you just want to know the Lord. Um, but of course, we've been on the other end of the spectrum as David has too. And Psalm 22 is David expressing that on the other side of it where he says, he's sorrowful and he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me? Just those times when it's like, where are you, God? Even Jesus, as we looked at Easter last Sunday, he quoted Psalm 22 from the cross, didn't he? He quoted the, uh, the psalm that David wrote and said, God, why are you forsaking me? Why do I have to go through this? Why is this happening? And like David and like our Lord himself, I have felt that as well. Lord, where are you? How come this is happening to me? And we feel that music or this song or this poem is an expression. It's an outlet to express our angst in our heart just as it is to express our love and our joy in the Lord. It helps us sort out our inner lives. This music just coming out. I've been in ministry for quite a while and um, was doing ministry when I was in college. And I used to do youth ministry, work with uh, teenagers. And my role with that group was to lead the music time. So I was the worship leader. I would sing the songs and do what Steve's done this morning. We'd lead with the young, with the young people, the high school and the college students. And that was a time in my life when I was young in my faith. I was passionate for the Lord. Hopefully I can maintain that passion, right? That's something that we do throughout our lives, but we want to maintain that passion in the Lord. But it was a time when music was just flowing out of me for whatever reason. And so there were a couple of songs in particular that I had written that we were singing in that youth group. And we would sing uh, every, every week. We would sing those songs. And uh, again, I don't say that those were good songs, but they were songs that came from my heart in the Lord and were things that we sang together as young people and so I'm grateful that maybe my wife, Alicia, is the only one that has heard those songs, and uh, you won't be hearing them this morning. Um, but uh, those songs did represent my heart for the Lord at the time, and there were things that we sang together as a youth group and were received in that way. And um, so those things went with my youth, and you go on in life, and you do things, and you forget about them. And so it would surprise you, and it surprised me, certainly, to realize that a few years later, I was at a Christian camp. It was in the evening. It was during the worship service. And there was a group there and a worship leader whom I didn't know. And to my surprise, he was singing one of my songs. And I was like, how in the world did this song come to this camp and to this person. It is not on K-Wave, it is not on the radio. Uh, how did he learn this? And so I came to realize afterwards that we had mutual friends. And so there was a friend of a friend of a friend and uh, this song had traveled down through these networks of friends and didn't even necessarily realize that it was a song that I had written. And um, again, I'm not sure if I should be flattered or embarrassed. <laughs> 
but, uh, but there was a song, an expression of the Lord, something that had carried on. And so I start this way because this morning I want to share with you about a couple of songs. Um, one of my favorite stories about worship is found in the book of Acts. It's in chapter 16. It's in verse 25. I'm not going to read it uh, for the sake of time, but it's important as we reference and think about Philippians chapter 2. It's uh, something that happens in Philippi. So Acts 16 uh, coincides with Paul's ministry in Philippi. And so we see in Acts chapter 16, verse 25, that Paul and Silas, uh, Silas was Paul's companion, uh, they are preaching and sharing the good news of Jesus throughout the city of Philippi. And the leadership of that town are not pleased with them sharing the gospel. They are not happy about Paul and Silas going around and talking about Jesus. And part of the reason for that is, is that people are being affected. They're being changed. And it's affecting business, for example. There are local businesses who the, the people's values are changing, and so they're no longer buying the goods that are being sold because they're idolatrous. And so these people who are losing their business because of the sake of the gospel are not happy about this happening. And so uh, they, they bring up charges against Paul and Silas, they accuse them, they stir up trouble, and they're arrested and they're thrown into prison. And we are told this amazing story in verse 25, that at midnight, bound in stocks, in the dark, Locked into the deepest depths of the Philippian jail, Paul and Silas are praying and singing to the Lord. It's midnight, and they're singing hymns to God. And what's more, we see in the story that, uh, that the prisoners and even the, even the guard, even the jailer, is listening to them. They're, they're drawn in. What is this? These, these strange guys that are singing to the Lord while they're in the jail. And what happens is one of the most miraculous things that you could see in the book of Acts. Uh, it's a powerful story. We learn that the earth shakes, the foundation of the jail is rocked, and their bonds are loose, and God frees them from that jail miraculously. And, and my first thought is, quick, let's get out of here, right? No, that's not what they do. What they do is, is they stay the jailer is about to kill himself because it's his job to keep them secure. And they say, no, no, don't, don't take your life. You are so important to God. We're, not, we're all here. Nobody has left. And that's an amazing miracle too, right? Because Paul and Silas hadn't left, but none of the other prisoners had left either. And so we see that the jailer comes down, he falls down before them, and he says, what must I do to be saved? And Paul and Silas share the gospel with him, and it says that he and his whole family uh, come to faith. They accept Christ as their Savior. They're baptized that very night into the Lord. It's this miraculous thing that God did through their prayers, through their worship, of course, through God's power. It's amazing. And I've often wondered, what songs do you think they were singing that night while they were in jail? I think I would like to know that hymn, to know what was in their hearts and their prayers. Uh, no doubt it was a song born out of deep love for God and a commitment to him, even in the midst of trials and hard experiences. This morning, our text is a response to a worship song like this, written by the Apostle Paul. Paul's emotions and beliefs overflow into poetry in this fledgling young church, and you can find that um, poem, that song, in Philippians 2, 6 through 11. That's not the main text that I've picked this morning, but it's uh, the text that we're reading as a response to this. And I'm going to read verses 6 through 11 just so that you can, can hear what it is. It says, um, I'm going to start in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, <coughs> excuse me, therefore God has highly exalted him 
and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we have this powerful word, and the main thing that I want to point out to you is that this is actually a song. When you read it in Greek, it's called the Christ hymn. And it is believed that it may be one of the very first liturgical hymns that were chanted and sung by the early church in Syria and Turkey and Greece, which is where Philippi is. And so, of course, I can't prove this, and I certainly don't want to add to God's word, but I'd like to think that maybe Paul was in that jail and he was thinking on the Lord and thinking all that God had done and that this song was born out of that night in jail course we don't know but this is a song it's a hymn that Paul wrote and it is an expression of what we just celebrated in on Easter it is a song about the pre-existent God who humbled himself by taking the form of a servant and though he was God of gods he became obedient to the point of death on a cross and through his death and suffering he made the way that you and I could be forgiven of our sin saved, reconciled, and put into a relationship with God. And because he has done this, God the Father chose to exalt Jesus, it says in verses 10 and 11, above every name, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords, and that we're told that someday every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess, all of heaven and earth and everything under the earth is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. And so Paul is declaring that Jesus is worthy of our worship. That is his worship song. Jesus is worthy of being followed. He's worthy of our worship. Someday he's going to make it all right. That's what this song is about. And so when we get to our text in verse 12, uh, we are seeing that obedience is the natural reaction to worship. So it says, therefore, my beloved, as you have obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So obedience is something that follows worship. Um, it is worship that turns, worship follows wonder. We look at God and we're in awe of him and so we worship. And so then we see what Jesus has done and in that awe we re react, giving our life to him, to obey, to live as Jesus lived, to serve as he set the example of as we read those verses. Um, I love Eugene Peterson's translation. It's called the Message Bible, if you know it. Verses 12 and 13, he writes it this way. What I am getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life and salvation and reverent and sensitive before God. So Paul is saying, when I was with you in person, you were obedient and now, all the more in my absence, continue to be a, obedient, keep it up, um, that we would be so filled with awe and wonder at what God has done for us, that our natural reaction is obedience, that we love him because he first loved us, that we find it such a great privilege to follow in his footsteps as our master and as our mentor that we would want to serve as he served and to reject power for its own sake as he did, that we would want God's purposes accomplished more than our own privileges and preferences. I love this text because on the one hand, it's a great compliment that Paul is giving to this young church. He's saying, it's an encouraging word, he's saying, I see what you're doing, and you've been obedient. You've followed the Lord. What an encourage, encouraging thing to hear, right? To have somebody stand up and say, look, Lemon Cove, I see you. You're following the Lord. You've been obedient. You're doing what God wants you to do. That's an encouraging word. But it also is him saying, on the other hand, hear this exhortation. Keep it up. Don't let down. Don't let, let up. Keep following. Don't let your energy or your sensitivity to the Lord wane as you get older, as the years go by, right? We've, you, when you first come to Christ, you want to follow him. You're excited. But as the years go by, it tends to wane, and we don't 
stay faithful. And so he's saying, don't be like that. Double your efforts. Have energy. Do it. Uh, it's a call to authentic faith, to have, uh, to have integrity, to not be a hypocrite in our Christian faith, but to practice the ways of Jesus. That's what he's calling you and me to. So what does it mean? Here's a challenging verse. If you've heard this verse before in verse 12, what does it mean to work out your salvation? What does it mean to work out your salvation? Notice it doesn't say that we are to work for our salvation. It says that we are to work out our salvation. In this, there is an assumption that these people are already believers. These people know the Lord. They are already living in some obedience to Christ, and so Paul is challenging them to commit their lives even further than they already have. So this is not about works-based salvation. This is not about you earning your salvation. That's a misconception that has been associated with this verse at times. I think Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, when I think of what it means to be saved, that's a better verse for that idea. You know it. It's, it's where we get the idea of justification by faith, if you've heard that terminology. It says, for it is by grace that you have been saved, and that not of yourself. It is a gift of God and not from works so that no one can boast. So your salvation is God's doing. God is the one who's doing the saving. He is the one who's doing the calling. He is the one who has justified, if you want to use that language. By his spirit, he breathes new life into you, and through his, his son, he makes it possible for you to have a relationship with God uh, and to know him. That is something that God does. He is the initiator and the one who makes that possible. And Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 expresses that. But here in Philippians, this is more an emphasis on sanctification. That word just means being set apart, that we're constantly being set apart and growing. So God is the one who saves, as Ephesians says, but he is the one who continues to save. He is the one who sets you apart and enables you to go further and further and further um, if you know the Chronicles of Narnia, in the last book, they get called further up and further in, right? That's what Paul is saying here. Be sanctified. Grow in your faith. Be mature. Practice and live out what God is saying. Please him in all that you do and all that you think about. That is the call to work out our salvation. And I like this language that God is working into us. That's the Ephesians part what he wants us to work out. So God works it in, and we work it out. And the word for work here can literally be translated as energy. This word for work means energy. God is providing the energy that is at work in all of us, in each one of you if you're a Christian this morning. He gives you the energy to be actively transformed according to his will and according to his purpose. Ephesians 4, 12 and 13 talks about this. This is the great uh, discipleship verse. As you think about bringing your new pastor, you want a pastor who does discipleship. And it says that we, that we may, what is, what is it that the church's purpose is? That we may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is God's will for you. That is God's will for his church, not only individually, but collectively, us together. God is working it out. God is working it in, and we are working it out. Uh, and so that leads to the next thing that we are to do as we work out our salvation, and we are to do it with fear and trembling. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have awe and reverential respect for God. This is not the kind of fear that you think of when you think of somebody who is coercive or abusive. This is not saying that God wants you to shudder at him because he's going to strike you down with lightning if he sees you do something bad. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about having awe and respect for the Lord. My favorite example of this is probably in Luke chapter 8, where we read the story of the disciples crossing the Sea of Galilee in a boat. And you know the story probably that Jesus is asleep in the boat 
and the storm is raging and the disciples are freaking out. Even the fishermen are freaking out. What is going on? And they call on Jesus to save them from this storm. And Jesus wakes up and as you know, he stands up and he speaks to the storm. He speaks to the wind and the wave and he says, be still. And it was still. And what does it say? It says that the disciples were afraid. What were they afraid of? They were afraid of Jesus. Who is this guy who can speak and with a word calm the wind and the waves and control nature itself? They were afraid and trembling at who Jesus was. This measure of respect, this idea of who is this guy? He is incredible. He is not like anybody else. He is worthy of being followed and worthy of our worship. They caught a glimpse of him and were overwhelmed. Some of you are old enough to know and remember the televangelist Jim Baker. You guys know Jim Baker? Um, he was on TV in the 70s and the 80s. Maybe you saw him on TBN or, or other networks. Uh, he did some interesting things. He had like a Christian theme park, which was kind of weird. Um, but uh, he got into some trouble, um, mostly for sexual misconduct and also for accounting fraud. So he cooked the books, he stole money, and ultimately he went to prison for those crimes. Uh, many people have written about it, including Jim Baker. He wrote a book that's called I Was Wrong. So uh, at some point, he acknowledged his sin in that. But one time, and while he was in prison, he was visited by, um, by a journalist who interviewed him. And that journalist asked him this question. At what point did you stop loving God? And his answer is very revealing. He said... I never stopped loving God. That's, that's unexpected, right? What? You never stopped loving God? He said, I love Jesus the whole time. But then he said, I stopped fearing God. So he had forgot that part of loving God is fearing him. It's having this awe and respect that we wouldn't want to break God's heart, that we wouldn't want to grieve the Holy Spirit that we wouldn't want to put a barrier between us and God in the way that we live or the things that we do. And so with the remaining verses and time, verses 14 through 18, Paul gives us four applications, basically, of what it looks like to work out your salvation and put your faith into practice. Four things that will help you to fear and awe and respect the Lord and work out what God is working in. And the first one is in verse 14. And uh, he says, do it without complaining and grumbling. Don't be somebody who is a whiner or somebody who is argumentative. This verse suggests that when we don't complain, we are able to remain innocent and without sin. Complaining stirs up in us this natural uh, conflict. He's saying by, by not complaining, we, we're more likely to not choose sin. And this is in contrast in verse 14 and 15 with the crooked and twisted generation of non-Christians around them. So he's saying, I think that complaining and arguing in this case, help, it, it, it creates a reality where we lose perspective we no longer see things accurately for what they are. We see things for what our complaint is, and that causes us and leads us into sin because we forget that God is in charge. I don't know about you, but self-pity feels good. To me, self-pity feels good. It feels good to feel sorry for myself, but it can lead to disobedience and to a critical spirit and ultimately to a lack of faith. The second way in which we can put our faith into practice is found in verse 15, and that is by bringing light into the darkness. That is your job as a church. Putting our faith into practice, we bring light into the darkness of this generation. 
Um, and he uses a really cool metaphor as you look at this verse. He says that you should be like a shining star. You should be a luminary against the backdrop of the universe. Now, I live in Oakhurst, as has been said, and I would assume that Lemon Cove, and here where you live, is very similar. We have a unique experience in the world, which is we can actually see the stars, right? Uh, if you live in the city, if you lived in Los Angeles, or even near where I live, over in Fresno, or maybe even Visalia, I don't know, but uh, you can't look up and see the stars. We have that, that amazing reality where we can even see the Milky Way or perhaps even one of Elon Musk's satellites as they go flying by. <laughs> the darker the world, the brighter your light should be. And that's what he's saying. Be light in the darkness and don't let the darkness come into the church, right? Let the light shine even in God's church that it would be a place of light. Even Jesus called himself the light. He said, I am the light. He used that metaphor. And then he passes the title to you and says in Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Don't put it on a lampstand. Put it on a lampstand. Don't cover it and put it out, right? Jesus is the light and you and I are the light of the world. That means that we push back against evil. We brighten a room. We lighten up this world with God's beauty. We live blamelessly we live faithfully. Thirdly, he says, in order to put your faith into practice, hold fast to God's word. God's word is his living word. It is his help to you. We hold fast to the truth of the gospel against this perverse and twisted world that we live in. And it's through God's word that we find an anchor and are able to stand against the winds and the waves of the world. How well do you know God's word? Is it hidden in your heart that you wouldn't sin against the Lord? This is another reason to sing the Psalms, the Psalms, right? We sang some this morning and we're gonna sing in a little while. God's word in our heart that we wouldn't sin against the Lord and so we put it there through singing. Fourthly, we put our faith into practice by having joy in the face of suffering. Inevitably, there will be times of suffering in our lives. That is the sad truth. And that is what was going on with Paul in this story. He was suffering. He was dealing with all kinds of trials and tribulations. Um, you can read about it uh, a couple of different places. In 1 Corinthians in particular, I'm forgetting the exact reference, but he lists off all of these things that he went through, shipwreck and uh, bitten by snakes and people beating him and sitting in prison like we read, just a ton of different things that he suffered. And, and yet somehow he was able to keep joy. And he says that we should have joy in the midst of suffering. Well, how do you have joy when circumstances in your life are unbearable? Are you going through something that is unbearable? How can you have joy when that's true? Well, I think for one thing, by having hope, that's what the gospel is. It's remembering our future. Hope helps us release our grip on past failures. It's believing rather than grumbling that God is making things right in the end. It's one of the reasons why we have the hope of heaven, this idea that he is going to give for us a crown of righteousness if we'll run our race that will set our heart on him and the hope of heaven and what he has for us and the belief and the trust that he's going to renew and make all things as they should be. And so this morning as I close, I'd like to tell you um, that I have been praying for you, Lemon Cove Church, this past month. Um, my heart is with you as you seek a new pastor. Um, part of the reason why I wanted to come was because we also, at my church, at Sierra Vista Presbyterian Church, we also are going through a time of change. Our senior pastor has announced his retirement, and we have formed a PNC, as you guys have formed a PNC, a pastor's nominating committee, for those who don't know the Presbyterian lingo. Uh, and we are working through the process of finding a our next pastor, as you are, and so 
I feel that uncertainty of that transition. I'm sure some of you feel that way as well. When you don't know what's coming next, it brings anxiety and, and a measure of anxiousness. Um, and as I think about that situation, both for you at Lemon Cove and me at Sierra Vista, I also have been thinking a lot about what is a church need? What is your church need? What is my church need? And here in Philippians, we see some of the qualities that God is calling his people to that should be an encouragement to you. We've learned this morning that uh, God is calling his church to obedience, that he's calling us to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, that he's calling us to be dependent and to trust in his timing and his provision that God can handle it. He's telling us to be hopeful, people who don't complain when we don't understand what's going on. He's telling us that we should be light in the darkness even when we're waiting, right? And he's telling us that we should hold fast to God's word no matter what and have joy even when things are hard, even when conversations are hard, even when things aren't going the way that we want them to go. God can give us joy in the midst of those circumstances. And I'm trying to commit myself to live this way as I navigate our changes at church, and I invite you to do the same. Uh, the, the hymn that I've asked, that's a responsive hymn to end my sermon, is a song that's called He Will Hold Me Fast. I'm told that uh, you guys know this one, so that's encouraging. Um, I was, as I was preparing this week, especially feeling uh, the words from the third stanza, the third verse, when he says, those he saves are his delight. He will hold me fast. Precious in his holy sight, he will hold me fast. That's you and me. We are God's delight. That's you. You are precious to Jesus and his promises are true. I ask you to trust in them this morning. Father, I pray for your church. I pray for us as your people that you would help us to redouble our efforts to follow you and to love you, to allow your spirit into our hearts and into our lives that we might be obedient, not because we're compelled to, but because we have a great love for you. It's born out of worship, this song in our hearts that says, I love you, Jesus, and I want to follow you wherever you would lead me as a person and as a church, Lord. I pray that for your people and for myself this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
please sit. Let us now present the offering of our life and labor to the Lord with gladness. Hear our prayer. Blessed are you, God of all creation. Through your goodness, we have these gifts to share. Accept and use our offerings for your glory and for the service of your kingdom. Blessed be God forever. as we conclude our worship this morning and sing the hymn number 433, Rise Up, O Church of God. Again, it has been a blessing to be with you and to worship with you. Your hospitality has been wonderful. So um, receive this blessing, this benediction from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58, where it says, My beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Amen. <laughs>